Hello everyone and good morning and welcome to our online service today. You know, we're in the final quarter of 2020, in case you didn't know, a very bizarre year that's been one of the most unpredictable and challenging years, at least in my lifetime. And our desire for you today is that this service will fill up your cup. It'll lift and encourage your spirit and provide hope to you no matter what you might be facing. Whether you like where this world is currently headed, straight into a digital Babylon, or you have some serious angst about it, like a lot of people do, this morning we're gonna receive a spiritual antidote to what ails us. I invite you now to shut off all of your electronic, oh yeah, that would be counterproductive to an online audience. Don't do that. But I do want you to metaphorically tune out the outside world and tune into God's presence. Join us next for praise and worship together and let's ask God to restore our nation and save our world. Following that worship time, Pastor Bob is gonna take us through the final message in our Thriving in Digital Babylon series called The Antidote. And please stay tuned after his message for Eagle's Nest announcements. Thank you for being with us today. May God bless each of you. Enjoy the service.
Good morning, Eagle's Nest. My name is Taylor, and over on the piano is Andrew, and we have the privilege of leading you in worship this morning. Um, as we continue, we're going to slow it down a little bit for these next few songs, and I just want to invite you guys to just bask in his presence this morning a little bit. Um, there's a lot going on outside of these doors, and we get the opportunity to come in here every Sunday and meet with him and sit at his feet. Um, so we just want to thank him and praise him and meet with him, not for what he can do, but just for who he is.
nothing else and nothing else nothing else will do I just want you nothing else and nothing else nothing else will do I just want you and nothing else just want to sit here at your feet I'm caught up in this whole moment and I never want to be and I'm not here for blessings you don't owe me anything more than anything that you can do I just want you sing it out just y'all I just want you nothing else just Good morning and welcome to all of you who are worshiping with us online and here in the building. Do any of you remember the beginning of the Indiana Jones movie, The Temple of Doom? It starts with Indiana Jones being poisoned, though he really shouldn't have been. He should have seen it coming, but he didn't, but that's a whole other subject. But he had to fight, if you remember, to get the antidote. Here's the Lego version of that scene. <laughs> That's funny right there. We've been in a series called Digital Babylon, thriving in the new digital age. Whether we like it or not, we're being pushed further and further into the digital world and technology is changing the way we live our lives and the way we do things and it will continue to do so into the unforeseeable, unforeseeable future. Technology is a wonderful thing, but it's easy to get hooked on. Near Eyal writes in his book, Hooked, he says a 2011 university study suggested that people check their phones 34 times per day. However, he says that industry insiders believe that number is closer to 150 times per day. Face it, he says, we're hooked. Being hooked, he all says, 
is the pull to visit YouTube or Facebook or Twitter for just a few moments only to find yourself still tapping and scrolling an hour later. Or like me, sometimes I'll sit down and I'm, I don't have anything to do and I feel compelled to just begin to search for things on my phone. Folks, we're being hooked. He continues to write, he all continues to write. He says, cognitive psychologists define habits as automatic behaviors triggered by situational cues, things we do with little or no conscious thought. The products and services, he says, we use habitually alter our everyday behavior just as their designers intended them to do. Our actions have been engineered, he writes. The point that he's making is that technology is designed to be addictive. Don't raise your hands, but how many of you check your phone within 15 minutes of waking up? As the famous comedian Jeff Foxworthy puts it, if you check your phone within 15 minutes of waking up, you might be a technology redneck. <laughs> how many of you check your phones more than 34 times a day? Now again, don't raise your hand. But quoting the great Jeff Foxworthy, if you check your phone more than 34 times a day, you might be a technology redneck. You might be hooked. And so the million dollar question is this, how do we use technology without getting hooked. This morning we have the antidote, and unlike Indiana Jones, you don't have to fight us for it. The antidote is very simple. It's intentionality. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 12, the Apostle Paul writes this. He writes, all things are lawful for me, but all things are not helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. The antidote to the use of technology is to use technology intentionally. What Paul's writing about here is not, is not technology, but he's talking about in general, he, this is how he lives. And this verse has to be understood in its context. Paul, he actually says this very verse twice in 1 Corinthians. Here we just read it in 6.12 and also in chapter 10, verse 23. Both times he's talking about the things that God allows. He's not saying that everything's lawful and that we can do whatever we want. He's, there's some things that are sinful, we can't do those things. But he's saying those things that are not sinful, he says you've got a choice in what you do or don't do. He says and there's a lot of things that we can do that aren't good for us. You know, it might, it might not be sinful to eat 10 Hershey bars a day, but it's probably not a good idea. And people that work around me know that if I eat 10 uh, Hershey bars in a day, they probably need to clear out because I don't do well when I eat chocolate. And that's a kind of standing joke on our staff. But Paul is saying that he doesn't allow anything to gain power over his life. What Paul is doing here is balancing our liberty and our freedom. And folks, this balance is at the epicenter of modern life and technology. This balance is the fight of our time. Freedom is America's birthright. But the Bible warns us that we could get too much of a good thing. Os Guinness writes in his book, A Free People's Suicide, he says, freedom is unquestionably what Americans love supremely. And love of freedom is what makes Americans who they are. Freedom, he says, is the special glory of America, the chief boast of Americans. We love freedom. And the Bible talks about freedom. God wants us to have freedom. But the Bible is warning us here that freedom can become its own undoing, which is the very point that Guinness makes in his book. He says unfettered freedom could prove to be the Achilles heel of the modern world dissipating into license, triviality, corruption, and a grand undermining of authority. And license, triviality, corruption, and the undermining of authority are what Paul is talking about in the book of Corinthians, and it is what we are seeing in our news every day. So we need to ask ourselves, who's in control? Me or my phone? Me or my technology? me or my computer. Who's the parent and who's the child in our relationship with tech? Ben Sass writes in his book, Them, and I'm not saying I agree with Ben Sass's politics at all, but he does have a couple good books out there. He writes, we pretend that our screens serve us, but most of us have to admit, when we're being honest, that our screens are dictating the relationship. Is your use of tech is my use of tech intentional or are we on autopilot? And if you need help with that, please contact, contact us at hello at eaglesnest.ch. We're here to help you. But we want you to be intentional because 
Intentionality is the antidote in our use of technology. Paul writes in Galatians 5.13, he says, For you, brethren, have been called to liberty or freedom. Only do not use your liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. So the first thing about intentionality we learned is that we need to use our technology intentionally and not just go on autopilot. The second thing the Bible's teaching us here, and this applies to a lot of things, and it certainly applies to our use of technology, is use the word friend intentionally. Again, the Bible is dealing with the dangers of liberty here in, in Galatians chapter 5, 13, but it applies to where we are. The Bible is saying don't use your freedom as an occasion for the flesh just to fulfill your fleshly desires. It's the same thing that he was talking about in the book of Corinthians. He's saying don't use your liberty and your freedom to indulge ourselves or to indulge yourself. Instead of using your freedom selfishly or irresponsibly, he says use it to serve one another through love. And by the way, there are a hundred uses of the term one another in the New Testament. Fifty-nine of them teach us how to relate to each other directly. And this is what Paul's talking about. This is what the Bible's talking about. Because one of the dangers of digital relationships, one of the, one of the dangers of digital Babylon is pseudo-friendships. These are friendships that we think are friends, but they're really not real friendships. Psychologist and professor of social studies at MIT, Sherry Turkle, took a group of students to visit an assisted living facility, or several assisted living facilities years ago, and as well as nursing homes, to study patients who were given a robot doll. This doll was called My Real Baby. It simulates the sounds and movements of an infant. In almost every instant, the patient at first was repelled by the doll. They didn't want anything to do with the doll. But soon after, men and women alike were caring for the doll as if it was a real baby even after they were told, this is just a mechanical thing. And a woman named Edna even ignored her visiting real-life great-granddaughter to continue doting on this doll, while simultaneously Turkle's students were telling her that it was just a doll and that she shouldn't feel any connection to it. Turkle writes, my real baby's demands seem to suit her better than those of her great-granddaughter. Actual kids, it turns out, she says, can be fussy. They can be demanding and unpredictable. But my real baby gave Edna confidence that she is able to manage the landscape when things get going. This is pseudo-community. Pseudo-community offers the illusion of friendships without its demands. Here this lady Edna was taking care of a child, but really it really had no demands, or at least it had demands she could control. And that's just not how relationships work. This same Sherry Turkle states in her book, Alone Together, he says, we're designing technologies that give us the illusion of companionship without the demands of friendship. Relationships that are real, folks, real relationships come with demands. Relationships that offer relationship without demands are pseudo relationships. Real relationships have a demand element. Yes, there's a reward element. We get things out of the relationships we're in. But we also have to put something in. And the danger of technology is to offer us relationships without any demands. Relationships that require no commitments. Commitments, as much as we don't like that word commitment, commitment is the secret to intimacy. Commitment is the secret to real friendships. Real friends make commitments to each other. And unfortunately, when we get online, we can have a lot of associations, but the danger is we have no real commitment to one another. John Wartburg writes, he says, intimacy and commitment go together like peas and carrots, like Bogart and Bacall, like Cheech and Chong. I would say like peanut butter and jelly. Commitment and intimacy. Intimacy is knowing and being known. It's being in relationship with people at various levels. Orper goes on the right, however, he says, along with a strong desire for intimacy comes a desire. We actually have a desire to bind ourselves to another, to our spouse, to our children, even to our friends. Our days are marked, he says. Our identities are formed and our intimate relationships are anchored by the commitments we make and keep. For instance, can you keep a secret? See, that's an invitation to in intimacy. It's an invitation to relationship, but it comes with a requirement. It comes with a commitment. Would you do me a favor? Want to have coffee on Thursday? Want to be my friend? Want to become a parent? Want to commit to God? 
No demand relationships may sound good and even feel good, but they are not the same as friendships that are built upon mutual commitment to one another. Commitment is the foundation of relationship because without commitments, there can be no trust. And without trust, there can be no intimacy. Folks, trust is the glue that keeps relationships together. And pseudo-friendships, which we can often find in technology, and not just in technology, in other places, but we're focusing on right now on Digital Babylon. Pseudo-friendships put real friendship at risk. In other words, we will have a tendency, like the real baby doll, to gravitate towards pseudo-friendships, pseudo-relationships, because they're so low demand. But in the end, it's like drinking salt water. We're stealing the very relationships that we desire by making, by gravitating towards these types of relationships versus real relationships, which are messy, real relationships, which are demanding. Real, you know, even your best of friends can get on your nerves once in a while. If you, my wife, she wouldn't do it if I got her on TV here, but, but if my wife was honest over 32 years, I'd gotten on her nerves many, many times, but we're committed to each other. She still loves me. She's never gotten me upset. You know, I mean, she doesn't drive me nuts at all. But I drive her nuts. Folks, Ben Sass writes, he says, like the dog with the bone who sees himself below the bridge in the water. And he says to himself, look at that bone, he barks. And full of the desire, he ends up losing the real bone that's in his mouth because he wants to chase an imaginary bone that turns out to be nothing at all. Folks, make no bones about it, pun intended. Levels of friendship are determined by the levels of commitment we make. An online friend, and an online friend can be a friend, but it's not at the same level as a friend you do life with. I'm not saying we can't have online friendship. There's a lot of things that we need to address there. There's dangers of getting to know people that we don't know, and that's a whole nother discussion altogether. And I'm not saying we can't get to know people online. In fact, that's a great way to begin to know people, but it doesn't replace them. I have a good friend uh, that, it lives in the state of Washington. You know, I, we, we can converse on internet. We can converse, you know, we can converse by mail. We can converse by phone. But that friendship's not at the same level as the friends that I have here in Delaware. And it's not because we don't want it to do. It's because we're separated by a whole continent. You know, he's not available to me, and there's no way I can make a commitment to him either beyond certain things. And so relationships, the levels of relationships are really determined by our levels of commitment. You know, John, John MacArthur wrote a book called 12 Ordinary Men. It's about the 12 apostles. And he, he brings out in that book that there's four lists of Jesus' disciples in the New Testament. And we're going to give you those texts. I'm not going to go over those. We'll, give you the, we'll put them up on a heading here. But all four of these lists list the disciples in three groups of four. And the groups are always the same, and they're always headed by the same person. The first group, Peter, James, John, and Andrew spent more time with Jesus than others. And the three of them were in Jesus' inner circle. Peter, James, and John were with Christ at special times when Andrew wasn't. Talk about potential conflict. How would you like to be like in a group of four and you're the man, odd man out? So Jesus is teaching us something about relationships and levels of relationships and intimacy by the way he even orchestrated how he interacted with his very disciples. So the first group is Peter, James, and John. Peter is the closest friend to Jesus. He's the one that Jesus leans on the most. And you have James and John. They're always with Jesus special times. And Andrew has a different kind of relationship when you study the life of Andrew. The second group, Philip, Bartholomew, who's also known as Nathaniel, Thomas, and Matthew, they're not as high profile in the Gospels, but they're always grouped together. And they spent less time, or at least less recorded time, with Jesus than the first group. And then the third group, James, the son of Alphaeus, uh, and Lebius, who's known as Thaddeus, and Simon, and Judas Iscariot, this group is more distant than the other two, and there is less recorded time than the second group and the first group. And the point is, is that even Jesus Christ, who is the Son of God incarnate, even he had different levels of friendship, and that friendships, those levels of friendships were impacted and affected by and determined by the levels of commitment with people's time and energy. You study that in, in depth, you'll see that. It's not because he loved less. It's because we can't make the same level of commitment to everyone. You know, if you have a thousand people in a church, you can't commit the same level of commitment to every 1,000 people in the church. It's just impossible. 
And that's the way life works. So a commitment to text one another is not the same as a commitment to be there for each other whenever is needed. And so what we're saying here today is as we go into the technological world, as we live in digital Babylon and we get to know people through online, through chats and through various things that we do, Zoom and things like that, those are not necessarily bad things. They can be good things. But we need to be intentional about the use of technology and we need to be intentional about the use of the word friend. I think we use that word friend like, for instance, will you friend me on Facebook? Well, if I have a thousand people follow me on Facebook, are they really my friends? You know, be more intentional about the use of the word friend. When I look at the word, I look at a friend. When I talk about a friend, if a friend calls me in the middle of the night at 2 o'clock, he better be sick, first of all. He knows that, okay? But if he's in need at 2 o'clock in the morning, I'm going to get out of bed and I'm going to go help him. But if I have 1,000 people on Facebook and, and number 756 calls me in the middle of the night, I'm not even answering the phone and neither are you. Why? It's impossible. You never get a moment's sleep. You never get a moment's rest. It's not a lack of love, folks. It's just being human. So the antidote to the technological digital world is use technology intentionally and use the word friend intentionally. And thirdly, be intentional about taking a digital Sabbath. Galatians 5.1 says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again in the yoke of bondage. Now, we know that this verse, Paul is talking about the Old Testament law and the way we use the Old Testament. And so that's what he's specifically talking about. But this is a principle that goes beyond what Paul is talking about directly in that text. He's saying we have to stand fast in our freedom. Freedom is a wonderful thing, but we have to protect our freedom because freedom in itself can lead us into bondage. And that's what he's talking about. He's saying don't be entangled again through our freedom in something that's going to bind us and trap us and imprison us. For instance, did you know that Steve Jobs, the founder of Apple, refused to let his children have an iPad? Let me say that again. Did you know that Steve Jobs, the founder of Apple, refused to let his children have an iPad? He told the New York Times, we limit how much technology our kids use. We think it's too dangerous for them. This is Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs is Steve Jobs is telling us that the use of technology needs to be limited. And he's one of the creators of the technology that we use all the time. What he's telling us is that technology is a good thing, but it can be dangerous. He's telling us that it's not safe for young kids. And I would add to that, it's not safe maybe for us adults. And thirdly, he says it needs limits. In other words, the old traceable line that the Greeks would say, too much of anything is bad, is mostly right. That's what these verses we've been quoting from the Bible are talking about. Too much of a good thing becomes a bad thing. Even freedom, freedom is a wonderful thing. The ability to choose what we do or don't do, it's a wonderful thing. But folks, if that's not limited, if that's not contained, freedom in itself becomes its own undoing. What the Greeks were teaching us, what the Bible's telling us, what Jobs is teaching us is that we need moderation even in good things. That overindulgence turns us into slaves. Contrary to public opinion, this is going to be something that our culture will struggle with, what I'm about to say. Our culture struggles with this truth. And the truth is this. Limits are good. We are living now in a world that teaches there are no limits. We've all heard the saying or been told, even by our loving parents, you can be anything you want to be. Folks, that's simply not true. If my parents came to me and said, you can be the next Michael Jordan or LeBron James, they're lying to me. There's no way. Yes, I was created equal with them. We're equal as human beings, but I'm not equal on the basketball court. Um, if my parents came to me and said, you're going to be the next quarterback of the Dallas Cowboys, you're going you're to take over Dak Prescott's job because he just broke his ankle, that'd be lying to me. Because even though I'm created equal with Dak, I'm not equal on the football field. Have you seen the man? He's like 6'6". There ain't an ounce of fat on the guy. He can throw a ball 65, 70 yards. Folks, I can't do that. I can't throw a ball 70 yards if I start on the 50-yard line. Now, if I were quarterback and the Cowboys might be winning now, but that's a whole other story. Folks, 
It's not true that we can be anything we want to be. There's things that I just don't have the potential for. There's things that you don't have the potential for. There's things that you have the potential for that are more than somebody else's. We're equal in value. But folks, everybody has different gifts. And that puts limits on our lives. There are limits to what I can do. I remember in 11th grade, in 11th, 11th grade of high school, our school bought this machine called the Leaper Machine. Now, before we got this leaper machine, I could barely touch the rim of the, of the basketball hoop. And after about two months of working on this leaper, you get under it and you press muscles and it would build your leg muscles. By the end of that season, I was getting my hand that far over the rim. I could almost dunk it. I just, my hands are small, so I couldn't quite dunk it. But I could get my hand over the rim. That thing created an ability for me to jump higher. But you know the truth of the matter is somebody with more potential, when they used the machine, they were jumping even farther than that. Why? Because there are limits to our potential. God created the world with limits for our own good. Rarely discussed in preacher, when preachers preach on the book of Genesis chapter 1, rarely do we discuss the limits God places on the things he creates. Those limits, though, are in fact there for identity purposes. In other words, things are determined by its limits. Its, its identity is, is partly shaped by its outline, its limits. I mean, there's limits that, that speak to our health and our well-being. Things that the, that the biblical writers would call shalom. Shalom is where everything works in harmony. In order for things to work in harmony, there has to be limits. Look at the limits in Genesis chapter 1. The sky is limited. The land is limited. The sea is limited. The night is limited. The day is limited. Work is limited. And in Genesis chapter 2, man is limited when he's not allowed to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Why? Because limits are good for us. Even Steve Jobs admitted that the technological limits, limits on technology is good. Why? Because there's a broader principle. Life is lived better when we live in lanes, when we, we recognize there's limits to the things that we do. Even freedom needs to be limited. Yeah, you can go on TV, you can watch TV all you want, you can get online all you want, you can use your phone all you want, but you'll live a better life if you limit it. One of the ways to stay free one of the ways to maintain and stand fast in our liberty, one of the ways to not abuse our freedom in anything is to set limits on it. Think about it. After God had taken Israel out of the land of Egypt in the book of Exodus by a mighty hand, he did mighty miracles. He led them to Mount Sinai, or what also called Mount Horeb, and he gave them the Ten Commandments. What was he doing? He was giving them a set of laws that would keep them free. Those laws were limits. Don't kill. In other words, your life, your freedom ends when another life begins. That's a limit. Those laws set limits. The, those limits were intended to keep the Israelites free. They were not given to steal their fun. They were not given to steal their liberty. They were given to enforce and reinforce and maintain and sustain their freedom. One of those limits was on work. In Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 12, it says, Observe the Sabbath to keep it holy. That means different. Special, as the Lord your God commanded you, six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, nor you, your sons, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your ox, nor your donkey, or your cattle, or the strangers within your gates, that your male servant and your female servant may rest as well as you. And remember that you are a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out of there by a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God commands you to keep the Sabbath day. In other words, God was saying, look, you came out of slavery. Let me teach you how to not become a slave again. Limit how much you work. Work's a good thing. People, we need to love work. Work is a gift from God. It's not something to be avoided. Work is a blessing, but even the blessing of work you get too much of a good thing. So God limits it. Why? To keep us from returning and keep them from returning to slavery. Socrates never had a smartphone, but he said, beware of the barrenness of a busy life. In truth, our creator is telling us the same thing. And the creator of technology, Steve Jobs, is telling us the same thing. Set some limits on your tech. Use tech wisely. Use it intentionally. Use the word friend intentionally. And be intentional about taking a tech Sabbath. And I'd encourage you. You know, 
you might want to use your regular Sabbath day where you take a day off and kind of align it with a text Sabbath so that you could spend, spend some time and schedule some appointments. Be intentional about scheduling time with your friends and your family. What would happen if we all began taking a physical Sabbath and a tech Sabbath on the same day? What would happen if we began to reclaim Sundays for relationship? What would happen if it's not Sunday, you know, if your day off is not Sunday, if some other day? What would happen if we began to reclaim our day off as a day we're not going to text and we're not going to do a lot of other stuff with technology, but instead we're going to interact and interface with the people we care about the most. You know, 20 years ago, Robert Putnam finished his landmark study of American culture in a book called Bowling Alone. At that time, 2000, around 2000, he said how much TV people watched was the largest indicator of how connected they were relationally. Now, this is before the smartphone. I can't imagine what he'd be saying now, or yes, I can't imagine. You know what he'd be saying? I think he'd be saying the use of our phones and our computers would be the number one determiner of our connectedness today. And so let me encourage you. There is an antidote to getting hooked on technology. We don't have to get hooked. Be intentional about the use of technology. Be intentional about how you use the word friend and be intentional about taking a Sabbath from tech and spending time, real time, with God. Not just reading a devotional on your phone. Put your devotion, your phone away and spend some time either in the Bible or just some time in prayer, laying on your bed, talking to God directly. Spend some real time with family and spend some real time with friends face to face. That will keep the time we spend on the Internet in check. Next week, we're going to begin a new series called The Word Made Flesh, the greatest story ever told. You don't want to miss it. Now you can join us as we close in a song followed by Pastor Jay and what's happening here at The Nest. And remember, if you need any help with any of the things we're talking about, just contact us at hello at eaglesnest.ch. I'll see you next week. Atmosphere is changing now. For the Spirit of the Lord is here. The evidence is all around that the Spirit of the Lord is here. The atmosphere is changing now For the Spirit of the Lord is here The evidence is all around The Spirit of the Lord is here Overflow Yeah.
can I then now for the spirit of the Lord is here the evidence is all around that the spirit of the Lord Well, thank you, Pastor Bob. Great questions. Have we allowed ourselves to be programmed by technology? I challenge each of us to take a few moments and consider our daily routines. You see, subliminal programming happens to us and we don't realize it. Let's inventory our day in the use of technology from wake up to bedtime and consider the minutes, hours, and impact of our screen time. Digital Babylon can definitely blind us to its mesmerizing power and we need to take the control back. That's the antidote. Even with a very painful 2020 outside of these walls, Eagle's Nest has continually been blessed with welcoming new faces and friends weekly to our community. We're grateful for you. Decisions for Christ, baptism, new memberships, and even through it all, our online ministry has continued to thrive. And we thank all of you for staying connected to us here at Eagle's Nest. To that end, if this is your first time joining us, welcome, a very special welcome to you. We'd love to hear from you and find out how we can serve you better. It's simple, just send us an email to hello at eaglesnest.ch and we'll connect with you. If you'd like, you can ask us for your free Eagles Nest t-shirt. For those that don't know, since June, we've added to the online format, but we also meet here live on Sunday mornings at 930 Everyone's welcome. No reservations are needed for the general populace unless you want to sit in a masked only section. I want to also thank all of you, many of you, for the kind words, letters, gestures to our leadership during October's Pastor Appreciation Month. And in honor of that, each week our kids show, KDD, has been interviewing our leadership team. This past week I got grilled by Edgar. Next week will be John McTernan, Parents of Eagles Nest Kids. We hope you're enjoying it. And if you haven't seen it yet, check it out. It'll be worth it. Big reminder for all of us, next Sunday is already November, and it's November 1st. That means daylight savings time ends. You fall back an hour. All the optimists in the room say, yay, more sunshine when you wake up in the morning, and I get to gain an hour. But the pessimists say, yeah, but you still got to get up. Either way, don't forget to fall back. It's next Sunday, and we start a new series too, so tune in on time. Eagles Nest Women's Ministry, Divine Design, has scheduled their next event called Coffee House. Ladies come out for fellowship together. One of our very own will be sharing her testimony, and rumor has it they're going to have a special ladies trio leading song. I'm not supposed to tell you who it is, that it's Taylor, Juanita, and Melinda. So you'll just have to come to find out. So ladies, please sign up on Realm and let us know you're coming. That's happening Saturday, November 14th, 6.30 p.m., right here in the sanctuary. And never to be outdone, men, we're also scheduled for our next men's breakfast. That's happening the following week, Saturday, November 21st at 8.30 a.m. Following what is sure to be a very heart-healthy breakfast, <laughs> and our guest speaker, we will then roll up our sleeves for an Eagle's Nest workday. So men, that's next month, Saturday, 21 November, a breakfast followed by workday. Please sign up on Realm to join us. Young people. We are scheduling two events in November because we know you're starved for attention and you need to get outside. Two dates, one of them is going to be an indoor thing and one's an outdoor thing. Both events are designed for this age group, middle schoolers, high schoolers, and really any of our 20-somethings, the college-age students, are all welcome to attend either one or both. First is the outdoor event. It's happening on November 14th, that's the Saturday, going to go ape. Go Ape is in Bear, Delaware. I'm telling you, I've been on this ropes course. It's a lot of fun. They give you some training on the ground so you can kind of get your comfort level with all of it. Come out, have some fun. We, need, we do have several youth leaders and volunteers to help lead our little monkeys, so don't be afraid of it. Come out and join us. Go Ape, Saturday, November 14th, but we need you to sign up. It's built as an event in Realm, so sign up there. If you don't know how to do that, send us an email at hello at eaglesnest.ch. The second event also needs your registration, young people. That'll be later that same week, happening on Friday night, November 20th at 8 p.m. We'll have snacks and a watch party. 
all designed around Hearts on Fire conference. Now this is a live event normally, but they've redesigned it for a video event. So come on out, our middle schoolers, high schoolers, 20 somethings meet here in the 220 room. We'll blow open the doors and we'll go into the cafeteria if we need to, but let's join together to do that. For all of you out there that love audio only options, maybe your daily commute or during your personal workouts, we're excited to tell you about a new platform for you to ingest more Eagle's Nest into your online diet. Coming very soon, we're now exploring podcasts. Finalizing some technical logistics and working through all of that, but we're going to start by launching Digging Deeper Moments podcast. So stay tuned to our website for more information. That's at eaglesnest.ch, or you can join us on any of our social platforms. Sign up on Realm, Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. Hey, we like you, so like us. And not only that, follow us, make a comment, subscribe, and help us share our Eagle's Nest content online. I'm frequently asked how to financially support Eagle's Nest Ministries. You can do that very easily by going to our website. Thank all of you for giving generously to Eagle's Nest and all you do to support our mission, which is to serve our community by doing good, build relationships, real ones with one another, all the while making fully devoted followers of Christ. If you're overwhelmed with the difficulties of life, struggling to find purpose, or you just need prayer, we're here for you. If you want to learn more about what it means to live out your Christian faith, we'd love the opportunity to talk with you about that as well. Whatever we can do to minister to you, please reach out to us to start that conversation. It's simple as sending an email to hello at eaglesnest.ch and we will meet you there. Worship, connect, and serve wherever you are. Have a great week. Take care.